So, writing an ode magazine, a former foreign correspondent lamented how her reporting had previously helped to reinforce what she called the stereotypic image propagated in the Western media of a desperate and hopeless Africa. Seldom are stories of renewal reported in the mainstream press, much less any mention that today's conditions there are deeply rooted in 400 years of slavery and a century of imperialism. But there is another Africa, the unreported continent of hope, creativity, and community. At its heart is the philosophical foundation of African culture, which is summed up in the word Ubuntu. As Chin Tauber wrote, the concept of Ubuntu rests on the idea that people exist by the grace of the community to which they belong, and that they are important to the degree to which they take responsibility for the other members of that community. Your identity is not shaped so much by an inner quest, but by entering into a purposeful relationship with your community. Here in the US, we've largely lost that sense of community, and the pain is palpable. Restoring community is essential if we're going to restore the land because they're inextricably linked, actually one and the same thing. The brilliant permaculturist Ali Sharif, who has worked extensively for many years in the countries of the South, told us once that he felt that the North and South have much to gain from each other. What we call the true biotechnologies, systemic nature-based solutions being developed here in the North can greatly benefit the South. But the South can model for the North what we need most, the restoration of the social fabric of community. So we're very deeply honored to have with us today Wanjira Matai, all the way from East Africa. The movement Wanjira represents as international liaison reweaves community while it restores the land. Wanjira's mother, Wangari Matai, the Deputy Environment Minister for Kenya founded the Green Belt Movement and just last week, I'm sure you know, received the Nobel Peace Prize. She is notably the first environmentalist ever to receive the award. As the Nobel Committee noted, we have added a new dimension to the concept of peace adding that they have emphasized the environment, democracy building, and human rights, and especially women's rights with their choice. As the innovator behind the Green Belt Movement, we must honor Wangari's work en route to introducing Wanjira. In 1976, witnessing her country's poverty and deteriorating environment, in particular, a forest cover reduced to 2%. Wangari started a grassroots organization whose main focus would be the planting of trees around Kenya by groups of women. The goal was both to conserve and restore the environment and to improve people's quality of life and provide them with incomes. When our resources become scarce, we fight over them, she said. In managing our resources and in sustainable development, we plant the seeds of peace. The Green Belt Movement has assisted an active core of 30,000 women in planting more than 30 million trees in Kenya. And in 1986, wait, there's more. In 1986, a Pan-African Green Belt Network was established with similar tree planting groups now in Tanzania, Uganda, Malawi, Lesotho, Ethiopia, and Zimbabwe. Wanjira is a powerful voice of the new Africa and the next generation of leadership in the Greenbelt movement. Like her mother, Wanjira went to school here in the U.S. 
She earned a master's degree in international health and business administration at Emory University in Atlanta. She later worked for the Carter Presidential Center's health programs for six years before returning to Kenya to work with the Greenbelt Movement. This movement is extraordinary because, like Latifa Simon's Center for Young Women's Development, it involves previously disenfranchised women empowering themselves to make positive changes that create a cascade of benefits to the entire community. In both cases, remarkable leaders help mobilize, coalesce, and shape the collective energy. In the case of Greenbelt, they've had remarkable success on an enormous scale in conditions of extreme poverty and environmental degradation. And until recently, all of this was achieved despite the extreme hostility of a repressive, corrupt, and dictatorial regime. We have much to learn from the success of the Greenbelt Movement, which in no small part is attributable to the fact that it's principally operated by women. It's one of the most inspiring ecological and socioeconomic movements of our time, and it's a huge privilege to welcome its standard bearer for the next generation, Wanjira Matai. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you very much. Thank you, my gosh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to take all of you home with me. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nina, for that kind introduction. I have to tell you, when I came from Kenya on Thursday, I really did not know what to expect. But I've had the best two days in a long time. Thank you so much. Thanks. I have to tell you, we've been celebrating in Nairobi, as you all know, from the Nobel Peace Prize, and it's really been a revolutionary few weeks in terms of coming up to the prize announcement. But I can tell you that in many ways, there was so much happening. And in a divine sense, you never know what prepares you for situations like this, because we had been beginning to start what was a visionary idea that I'll be talking about today in terms of rehabilitating forest areas. And this recognition adds such energy to that initiative. So I'm going to share with you some of the ideas that the Greenbelt Movement has been working on. But before I do that, of course, I want to talk a little bit about some of the other programs. Many people know the Greenbelt Movement's work in tree planting, but very little is known about some of the other work that we do. So I want to just talk a little bit about that. The Greenbelt Movement is unique, actually, in its programming because we don't just go into a community and start a project. Many times we actually have to listen. Isn't that a great idea? To listen to what the community wants to do. And so we have a water harvesting initiative that is mainly popular in the semi-arid areas. You know, when it rains, it pours. And when you don't have rain, people have a very difficult time even feeding themselves and their families. And so this project helps people build community sand dams where they harvest water during the rainy season and use it through the dry seasons as well. And there's also a food security program, and this food security program focuses specifically on indigenous food crops, trying to encourage people to go back to the food crops that are good for the soils in the areas in which they live, so that in cultivating and in actually trying to secure sustainable uh, food security for their families, they're able to grow foods that were actually blessed to be grown in those areas. We also have what is really the cornerstone of our projects, which is the Civic and Environmental Education Program. Now, this program is actually very interesting, and I'll talk a little bit more about it, because it really does frame what the Green Belt Movement does. It's a project that ex takes community members through an exploration, a self-knowledge. We call it the program of self-knowledge, that until you actually, from a deep place, appreciate the connection between the environment and the degradation and poverty, you will not be able to become a good environmental steward. And that we must start with ourselves, with an exploration of where we stand and our understanding of where that, those problems come from to be able to address them. 
We also have an advocacy and networking program, which many of you are probably familiar with. It's a lot of the work of the Greenbelt movement that has been out in the public, a lot of the work that has been involved in saving the commons and saving, protecting a lot of the public spaces in Kenya, a lot of the, pro the programs for which we were beaten by the police were related to this program uh, in advocacy and networking. But we're grateful especially because in many ways the Greenbelt movement is responsible for bringing the environmental agenda to the forefront in Kenya. And this program was very much a part of that effort. Over the years, the United Nations has encouraged the Greenbelt movement to share its experience with other countries. And Nina mentioned that, so I will not delve into it deeply. But the Pan-African Initiative is very much a core part of what we do. And instead of actually duplicating the Greenbelt movement in other countries, what we do is really encourage people to come and visit and experience the Greenbelt movement. And when they do, they're inspired in many different ways to go back and start even if it's not the Greenbelt Movement in Tanzania, but something that is inspired by the community empowerment and conservation approach that is very unique to the Greenbelt Movement. The Greenbelt Safaris is a very new initiative, actually, and some of the people in this audience have been a part of it. It's an initiative that we thought it's very important for our friends and our, and our partners to come and actually experience the Greenbelt Movement rather than just read about it. And so the Greenbelt Safaris is an ecotourism initiative that is also an income-generating activity for the Greenbelt Movement. And what happens is we have a cultural exchange. People come and they spend time with the, the women who are the movement. And they spend two to three days living with them, working with them, eating with them. And I can assure you, they are not the same when they leave. <laughs> and of course, the capacity building program, which is really broad, and many of the programs that I've talked about are part of the capacity building initiative. But this is more related to income generation and trying to put money in the hands of the women we work with and expanding some of the things that they do to be able to generate income. We have programs where we're encouraging them to keep bees for beekeeping. We're trying to encourage them to dry their vegetables and sell and, and actually even save them for the, for the drought season. And so there are def different initiatives and it's growing related to silk, keeping silkworms and many little initiatives. But the women are excited. In many ways, the tree planting program has expanded them and they get antsy. Every time you visit, they tell you, so what's the new project? We need something else. People often wonder what exactly the Greenbelt Movement's tree planting program is and what does it do? How do we start? How do communities get involved? And I want to take some time to explain this because I think it's really at the core of the success of the movement. The Civic and Environmental Education Program has a seminar which we call Knowing Yourself. It's an exploration of, you, you know, you sit in a community and you go through a self-exploratory session. What are the problems? We ask very simple questions, and of course it's a participatory exercise. What are the problems that you face in this community? And I can tell you, we get lists, hundreds sometimes, of items and problems and concerns. And then we move on to, so how do you think we can solve these problems? Because many times they think you're probably there to solve those problems. But we say, no, how do you think you can solve those problems? And of course they give you a list as well of how they, no, sorry, we actually say, where do you think these problems come from before we go to how do you think you can solve them? And inevitably the problems come from everywhere else but themselves. There's government, there's my neighbor, there's everybody else. And after a little bit of exploration, we start to understand that we too have a role to play in the, the problems that we've identified. And slowly by slowly, they start to identify their role in addressing some of those problems. That the poverty, the lack of food, the lack of water may be related to the way they are farming. It may be related to how they're not caring about the, the, the commons and not sharing the commons. The farming and the, the protection of rivers, the protection of the forest, and how that affects the ecosystem in which sustains them. And so after three days, they have understood in an interesting way that they too have a role to play in solving the problems that they face. And of course the Greenbelt Movement's approach in entering any community is through tree planting and after that we do begin a tree planting initiative that helps the community themselves to organize themselves but actually goes through a very intense process of self-exploration first. 
So during the very first and second phases of the Green Belt Movement, we encouraged communities to grow trees and to, to plant trees in common spaces, in schools, in churches, around their farms, in their own areas, along the rivers, along the road reserves. And this was really to green the country and help them transform Form their own landscapes, even for psychological therapy. Many times you go to places and now they're covered in trees and the people there really are much happier. And so over the last 30 years, the Greenbelt Movement has organized over 100,000 women into 6,000 groups and 600 other networks to plant over 30 million trees. But in the process, they've also transformed the lives of their families, their landscapes, and there are many ways they're enjoying the benefits. They're enjoying the shade, they're enjoying the fuel wood, they're enjoying building material, and they've gone through a permanent transformation of what it really means to be an environmental steward. Now, one of the things that the Greenbelt Movement is extremely particular about is that people don't take action if they don't understand. And so we have this lasting 30 years of, of work, mainly because people understand why they're involved in this work. I have to tell you an interesting story that happened very recently. A, a student came and visited us at the Greenbelt Movement, and she was doing her research on the organizations in Kenya that claim to have empowered women. And so she came to the Greenbelt Movement because she heard that, that we have empowered women. And she asked me, listen, I have a, a survey that I would like to conduct in one of the Greenbelt Movement communities. And uh, I have indices that are predictive of empowerment. And so I want to go and test these indices. And so I, I encouraged her. I didn't want to not let her go because that might have been a little bit more problematic. So I thought, well, let me let her go, but I wanted to encourage her to be more open-minded because some of the, the indices she had was socioeconomic status, she had um, income level, and things that were really far out and so would probably have disqualified the Green Belt Movement women from the empowerment movement. And so she went off and had lectured her a little bit, but very calmly, and she went and came back after three days, and she told me, Wanjira, you will not believe it. I said, what? Those women completely changed my definition of empowerment. <laughs> And so I stand here today to let you know that the women of the Greenbelt Movement have done incredible things and are moving into what is now a revolutionary idea to protect ecosystems that serve our country with water and fauna and flora that we enjoy. And so I think one of the biggest challenges we have in Kenya today is our forest cover. Nina mentioned that we have 2% forest cover. About 10% is required for sustainable development. And so we are at a threatening place. Our forests are actually threatened with logging, cultivation, settlements, and there's so much going on that is threatening the very existence of ourselves. In many ways, peace and environment are connected. The ecosystem that we are focusing on for the Green Belt Movement that is really threatened with, I think, 160,000 hectares have been destroyed and are needed to be restored. And the Green Belt Movement women are up to the challenge. As you can see, the, the destruction from logging, cultivation, and even charcoal, and this is at the core. This is where the water comes from for most of the urban centers in Kenya today. And so we have mobilized our women, and they are ready and planting thousands of trees right now and in an unprecedented partnership with the government, which is, as many people who know the history of the Greenbelt Movement know, the government and the Greenbelt Movement just did not mix. So now we are enjoying a partnership and the women of the Greenbelt Movement, barefoot foresters as we love to call them because they have perfected the art of tree planting without having to step into a classroom, and they do it much better than our foresters in the forest department do. As I mentioned earlier, as we make arrangements 
to get our women into the forest. I can't wait to see thousands of Greenbelt Movement women in the forest planting trees and, and teaching the foresters how it's done. We had a forester in, in the forest department in one of the areas who came to the Greenbelt Movement and said, I actually don't believe it's possible for these women to plant trees. You need to have some skills to plant trees. And we said, well, why don't you come for a tour and we'll show you uh, some of the work that the Greenbelt Movement women has done. In, in short, the man was completely dumbfounded. He had never seen so many trees in his entire career. And they declared that the Greenbelt Movement strategy will be the modus operandi for the restoration of forest areas. <laughs> So I'm so grateful to have been able to share that with you. And even then, I want to let you know that celebrations abound in the Greenbelt Movement offices when the Norwegian Nobel Committee announced that Wangari Mathai had won the Nobel Peace Prize. We were so happy. I cannot tell you. We are still spinning and tipsy. <laughs> Recognizing her visionary leadership just 30 years ago, recognizing the connection between peace, environment, democracy, she always told us that the environment is a very good indicator of good governance. If you go to a country and the environment is rotten, chances are the governance system is also rotten. But I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and share with you some of these ideas. Thank you so much. It's been a real honor to be with you.